Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. This is our fourth webinar in this year, 2023. Thank you for those who have been our faithful participants. We are happy to have you. And those who are joining us for the first time, we are also happy to have you. Um, today, we have a special presentation as usual. Um, our topic today is clinical application of PET CT in oncology. And we have one of the, the great NAMP members, Mr. Kintokun Adekume has Aziz as our speaker today. So I'm quickly going to read Mr. Kintokun's profile before I hand over to him. Mr. Kintokun Adekunle has started his career as a regulatory officer at the Nigerian Nuclear Regulatory Authority, NNRA, before moving abroad on a scholarship for a postgraduate degree in medical physics. He's a board certified medical physicist by the International Medical Physics Certification Board, IMPCB. He has spent over a decade in the Middle East working in tertiary hospitals as a medical physicist in diagnostic and interventional radiology and nuclear medicine. He also served as the hospital's radiation safety officer, developing and implementing a comprehensive hospital radiation safety program. In his last role in the Middle East, he worked as a senior medical physicist and was involved in teaching physics and radiation safety to resident doctors, technologists, and nurses. He also held a leading role in many projects, which include constructions of radiology and nuclear medicine departments, cyclotron facilities, cyclotron facility accreditation, and he was involved in accreditation processes. ACR, CBHI, and JCI. Mr. Kintogu, please, you quickly tell us the meaning of this. I was going to ask you what they stand for. But before, you, before I ask you to do that, I just want to say that uh, we're actually privileged to, to have uh, Mr. Kintogu with us. He recently relocated to Nigeria um, the end of, yeah, I think the end of last year, the last quarter of 2022. So he's here to share his wealth of uh, knowledge and experience with us. So um, this is who will be speaking with us today. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation and um, for agreeing to do this today. Yes. Yeah. So before you start your presentation, please, what does ACR, I think that's yeah, American. Actually, our presentation has to do with the, uh, somebody uh, certifying that the hospital is performing to the world standard. ACR is the American College of Radiology, and okay. CBI is like a local Saudi Arabia, like an accreditation in the Health Institute. And okay. ACI is like an international body that accredits uh, a joint commission for accreditation of health facility. All right. Thank you for the explanation. Thank you. So um, the floor is yours now. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me to present on clinical application of PET-CT in oncology. Uh, actually, we, uh, for this uh, webinar, we are, we are going to go through the, I'll give an overview of PET-CT, uh, characteristic of pet tracers, pet radionuclides, uh, principle of PET imaging, examples of pet radiopharmaceuticals. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit of examination steps for PET-CT. Uh, we'll talk about the advantage and limitations of PET-scan and clinical application of PET-CT in radiotherapy. We are going to look at FDG PET cancer detection, and we are going to talk about evaluation of uh, mass lesion using the PET uh, technique. Uh, we are going to look at also monitoring of tumor responses and how PET is used in radiation therapy. Just to start with an introduction, PET-CT is an hybrid device that combines its PET-CT and the, word and the PET using a single patient uh, uh, table. Uh, the PET is an evolumetric technique optimized to, for detection of annihilation photons. Uh, it allows precise tracking of spatial and temporary, temporary distribution of positron emitting radiopharmaceutical in patient. So spatial has to do with the, the, the size of the, of the uh, disease that can be seen and temporary resolution or distribution. Temporary resolution has to do with the uh, the ability of, uh, of the of the of the scanning image, uh, scanning uh, machine to detect uh, duration in distribution of radiopharmaceuticals over a period of time. I mean, how it's being cleared from the system. So we say we talk about temporary resolution. 
I just have to say that before we continue so I can have an idea of what I'm saying. And also, does it represent a unique functional uh, tomographic imaging and modalities based on biochemical and neochemicals by the TU? So, uh, a pet tracer, a pet tracer is a proton rich, uh, it's come from a proton rich nucleus and it's called positron. When a proton rich nucleus decay, they give out positron, which is antimatter. Antimatter means like, I cannot stay long in the, in, the, in the matter environment. And the positron has long, uh, low range, and in, in the matter environment is going to interact with the neighboring electron to produce what we call annihilation photons. These annihilation photons are, they normally have energy of 511 keV, and it goes in opposite direction, nearly 180 degree. As you can see on the, on the right side, this is an example of uh, the position is produced by this nucleus. Okay, sorry. So we have uh, uh, this is the nucleus, which is photon rich. It emits a positron and it, it, it annihilates or interact with a, a neighboring electron and they give out two photons. Each of them is 511. So we say that they are at 180 degrees from each other, which is not really, sometimes it's not. 100% 180, but almost nearly 180 degrees uh, from each other. So, uh, and also PET radionuclides, there are a lot of radionuclides that are used for PET CT, but the most common one, which is widely used, is fluorine 18. So, how do we get this radionuclide? There are two ways we can get this PET radionuclide. The first one is to it, through the linear, uh, through the cyclotron. Cyclotron is an accelerator that produces, uh, and it produces this radionuclide by Bombarding the target material, which is like, like for instance, oxygen 18, which could be a target material. When bombarded with a charged particle, it produces fluorine 18. So it's going to be it's a, it's a reaction that happens in the cyclotron. An example of accelerator produced with the nuclear include carbon 11, nitrogen 13, oxygen 15, and fluorine 18. The second way of generating uh, a, a positron or uh, 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 the tracer is to use the generator. Uh, the generator is a parent uh, doctor decay schedule. So a parent radioactive material is going to decay into a doctor radioactive material. And usually it comes in a, in a generator. Anybody that works in nuclear medicine, you know, you know what the person generator is. A generator normally has a column. The column is to bind the, the parent material onto the column. And when there's a decay, they, they, they be in the liquid inside the generator. I mean, when there is a decay, the, 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 the doctor will not bind to that column. So there will be, it will be easy for us to separate the doctor from the parent. So in that way, we can, we can take out the, the doctor's uh, doctor radioactive material and leave the parent uh, radioactive material in the generator. So uh, the process of taking out the doctor is called what we call the elution. Uh, we are eluting or we are milking the generator. It's a process that will take out the what? the radioactive data from the generator. And they commonly produce uh, radionuclear, uh, uh, generator produce radionuclear, PET radionuclear includes zinc, uh, copper 62, germanium, uh, gallium 68, and rubidium 82. Uh, rubidium is used for art uh, in the cardiac imaging. Uh, 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 gallium is used for normal body imaging, and the copper is not that common. Uh, in principle, how does this work? For us to understand, before we move on to use of PET in, uh, in oncology, we have to understand in the layman principle, in the layman terms, how PET CT works. Uh, PET CT include, involves the injection of a small amount of radiotracer into the patient body, which emits positron. The positron collides with an electron in the body and produces gamma, gamma ray, which is like a photon, two photons. And these two, two, two photons are detected by a ring of detector. Normally in PET-CT, we have a ring of detector. It goes round, you understand? So because the essence that we want to detect the, the photons on the opposite side, you understand? When they go, the system should be able to detect the two photons at the same time. And the PET is equipped with what? Uh, with algorithm for correct random incidents, scatter, dead time, and various sensitivity among the detectors. So normally the, the electronic, we have what we call the uh, coincident window, or what we call the electronic uh, coincident electronic window in a way. So if, if in, in PET, we don't have a physical collimator. 
we have what we call the electronic coordinator. It's like the window is set in such a way that the time difference between them will be so minimal, so that anything that comes later will be rejected. So it's an auto rejection, just like the way the photo, uh, uh, for, uh, the, uh, it works in nuclear medicine. We have the uh, photo, uh, photo, photo, uh, photo PhD, uh, the photo analyzer that set a window. Okay, anything that comes within this window is affected, and anything that comes outside this window is rejected. So CT is used for attention correction and create details of image of the body internal structure. So when you talk about attenuation correction, is to the prospect has very bad. Uh, it, it's not. It's not the, the the the. It's not a good a good technique to to give the detail or correct location of where the incident happened. So we need something like an attenuation map to, to correct for the exact location of where an event is taking place inside the body. So that's why we normally have an attenuation correction. We now you can use CT or you can even use a linear source which comes with the bed. But the best is still to use CT. So we got if you look at it, a, a, an, an, a, 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 a photon coming from central of the body will go a longer path before getting to the data compared to the one that is coming from the peripheral of the body. So that difference in the attenuation is going is not correctly recorded in PET. So CT will not give us a map that shows the differential attenuation of the photon within the body, and it helps to localize the, the disease to, to, the, to the point of origin. So by combining these two techniques, the PET and the CT, we can provide the precise anatomical information of both pathological and physiological optic of the treasure in the body. So there are different types of uh, uh, the pharmacy. Now, the first one I said about radionuclides, which are the ones used in PET, but these are not used on a standalone. We have to label those radionuclides or something. So, for instance, depending on what we are doing, uh, there are sometimes we look at metabolism in the body, then we talk about the chlorine uh, uh, FDG, which is like a glucose, uh, um, glucose analog. So, we have FLT, these are used for monitoring uh, metabolism. If you are looking for a, a, a hypoxia, hypoxia has to do with the, with the lack of oxygen. We know that success of the therapy depends on the oxygen oxygenation of the tumor. If the tumor is not properly oxygenated, then it becomes what it, it affects the outcome of the therapy. And the success of the therapy will, will be drastically reduced. So monitoring the approximate level of the, of the tumor matters a lot for a successful of the therapy planning. So we have other treatments that are that, that used for that, like chlorine uh, MI, so, and there are other ones. And also, we can also use to monitor apoptosis, that is the death of some cells. Uh, but also, we can use it to monitor the protein synthesis in the body. And also, tumor specific agents like the gallium, associate, dotatate, dot, or dotatum, whatever. It, so, this is like tumor specific things that thing. They monitor, they are used for neuroendocrine tumor uh, imaging. That's a neuroendocrine tumor. They are the one that has to do with the neuroendocrine tumor. So the PSMA is used for prostate. Uh, this is a biomarker for prostate. So in, um, after talking about the PET overview, also I'd like to tell you a bit about the procedure, the process the, the, for PET examination. Uh, we start with the pre-appointment instructions. We talk to the patient about the meals. He has to reduce the carbohydrate intake for at least 24 hours. He should go low on carb and also activity. He should not involve in strenuous activity. And also medication has to medication has to be advised. He has to tell us what medication he will be. The essence of giving a good instruction to the patient is to ensure that what the, the outcome of our test scan is, is, is successful. So if the patient goes and eats a lot of carbohydrates or expresses a, 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 a in or herself, then it, it's going to, it, we are going to have what we call muscular, uh, muscular glucose, you understand, metabolism. And this is going to affect, it's going to be like an artifact in the pet imaging. So we advise them properly before, the, before they come for the appointment that they have to watch their meal, they have to avoid alcohol, they have to reduce their strenuous activity, and they have, we have to look at their medication and make sure that the medication they are using does will not impede or will not affect the outcome of the of the pet. So on the day of on the day of uh, on the day of uh, 
and fear of scanning. And when the patient comes to the hospital, we look at, we give them instruction, we do some tests, like for instance, we do pregnancy tests to ensure that the patient is not pregnant. Also, we do, we check the glucose level for FDG, especially FDG, when you are looking at metabolism, we check the glucose level and make sure that the glucose level is low and it's not more than 140 milligram per deciliter. So we have to make sure up to 200. Anything higher glucose level, then we have to consult with the, with the doctor. And above 300 milligram per deciliter, we don't ad admit the, the patient, we just cancel the scan. Uh, also, after that, if the patient qualifies during the pre injections, injection uh, 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 test and other things, then we move on to the injection. We inject the patient normally in, for FDG, we normally inject the patient between 5 mercury to 20 mercury, depending on the patient size. But the average, for an average man, which is 70 kg, normally you get like it's 12 mercury. But if the technology in the system, the technology is an advanced one, you can go low on the dose to like 8 mercury for an average man. But in this case, we have to work on the acquisition time. And also we use the, the algorithms in the system to optimize the, uh, the processing and image quality. So when, after injecting the patient, we show the patient for injection that the patient has to remain calm. The lighting of the room where the patient is going to be injected has to be dim. Because you don't want anything that is going to affect or agitate the patient or make the patient to be anxious. Because we don't want metabolism, muscular metabolism. So we want the patient to be calm as much as possible. And we're going to stay there after injection for like minimum 45 minutes for the uptake. Uh, it's like between 45 minutes to one hour for the uptake. And after then, we ask, we instruct the patient to go and to go to the toilet before the scanning because you don't want to have radiatic in the in the in the in the bladder because this is going to also affect the outcome as well as for the whole body scan. It's going to affect the outcome, the, the, the final result, the image interpretation uh, by the physician. So after that, uh, we have the scanning. Scanning normally we scan for PET. It's, we start normally start with the CT, then we go to PET. And the, uh, the acquisition, because the pet, pet detector is not so big, it has limitations, you understand? So normally, we normally have like one bed, two bed, three bed, as well for whole body, we have three to four beds for whole body. And it's going to be stand in four, if it's three bed, it's going to be uh, three steps. First one, finish, then second one, different part of the body, and it finishes. So the scanning time per bed also varies depending on the technology that you are using, depending on the machine that you are using, and also sensitivity of the PET, PET scanner that you are using. And also, it also depends on, on, the, on, the, on the protocol that the, the center is using. So normally, like one minute to like uh, five minutes for the per bed. Normally, in our center for head and neck, we use like, uh, I mean, abroad, we use like four minutes for head and neck per bed. And for the whole body, we use like three minutes per, per bed for, for the scan. So this is uh, what we do. And post image processing has to do with the, what we do after the after we have finished acquiring the image. We are going to process it. We are going to apply the acclimation correction, and we are going to fuse the PET and, 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 and PET and CT images, and we are going to have the PET look. Okay. So sometimes, especially when we are looking back, we also need to have the the unprocessed, unacclimated. Uh, Pet, pet images so as to know if there's an artifact or not. So this is a summary of what we do when we do a pet scan. Uh, it's good also, now I want to talk more about the advantages of pet CT. Uh, pet, especially when it comes to oncology. Pet images is, is, is based on tracer principle and primarily generate images of function, including physiology, biochemistry, and metabolism in the body by analyzing the dyna dynamic behavior of the molecular organs and tissue. So we can accurately stage and localize the tumor. And also it's a, it's a good tool to, to detect early diagnosis of disease or, 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 or confirmation of presence of cancer or tumor. Uh, also we can use evaluation to evaluate the treatment effectiveness post therapy. We can know if the patient is responding well to therapy using the PET technique. And also easy detection of metastasis. And spend, we can detect med cancer using the bed, uh, it can be used to identify area of active cancer cells 
that may not be visible in other imaging models. You know, it's, it works with metabolism. So if there is high metabolism, you know that cancer cells are they, they consume a lot of glucose, they consume a lot of sugar because because they are very active cells. So not, not when we see an high metabolism, we think that the cancer is very is very is malignant. So that is a good one to 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 see an area. Sometimes the the, the uh, normal scan you may not see the you may not see the disease, but on PET you see the disease because if the cell is absorbing glucose, then it's going to show it's going to bright up on the on the image. Uh, also, it helps improve contouring accuracy. We are going to talk more about that. However, uh, despite that, the, the, the wide use of PET still have its own limitation. So the, it has a lower spatial resolution compared to other diagnostics like MRI or like CT. Uh, the, the, most of the PET system, uh, even other ones, they are like, their resolution is like between 5 millimeters to like 8 millimeters. And the newer versions are not more recent versions. We have like resolution of four to five millimeter. And also now, I've read that we have PCC that can do that have higher, better resolution even than four millimeter uh, uh, resolution. So it's difficult to accurately identify. So the, the problem is that if the if resolution is not that good, then it will be difficult to identify very small lesions. Or lesions located in area with high physiological uptake, such as the brain or the liver. You understand? Because that place there is a lot of uptake. Now, for you to be able to identify a very small tiny lesion in that in those areas, it's very difficult. So these are some of the uh, disadvantages or limitation of PCT. Uh, imaging can be affected by patient motion, respiratory motion, which can lead to image artifacts and reduce image quality. Yes, because the Compared, although the when you compare to MRI, the time, scanning time is still low, it's still, it's still faster, but it's, it's long enough for the patient to become very active on that. Especially when you are doing the whole body, whole body scan, take you like almost roughly like almost 20, uh, 20 minutes. So the patient has to be on the bed for 20 minutes. I think that uh, sometimes the patient feels very uncomfortable and have to move, you know, when the patient moves, they're going to introduce artifact into the into the image. Another thing that we have to uh, to avoid respiratory motion. There's no way you can do that. I said we have to do with 4D imaging. Where we have to monitor the, we have to do a gated uh, gated uh, uh, scanning. But unfortunately, most center does not even have this. So the best thing is to advise the patient to educate the patient how to breathe properly. You have to tell the patient how to breathe. And sometimes in my center, the first center I work in. They will call the patient and they will put the patient in the CT and they will be instructing the patient how to breathe properly. So at the scan will be it can be reproducible, you know, not to have a reproducible scan. As well when we are dealing with radiation therapy, we scan the patient and want to want to want to treat the patient. So the patient you know how to breathe. So you can replicate that breathing pattern when it's being treated. So I can you don't miss uh, you know because of the breathing, you don't miss uh, pathology uh, or lesion that needs to be treated. So, and lastly, it's very expensive. It's not readily available. I think in the whole country, we have only one center, if I'm not sure, if I'm not mistaken, that have PET CT, that has a functional PET CT scanner, which is, which is Mikio. So it's very scarce, it's not readily available. These are the challenges that we have, and it's, it's a bit expensive to, 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 to perform. So clinical application of PET CT. Radiotherapy. When you talk about application, it has a wide application. It can be used to characterize uh, likelihood of malignancy of the mass lesion, which is not readily discovered by biopsy, for which biopsy attempt has been failed. There are some lesions that you cannot you cannot talk about the how the proliferation of the of the, of the cancer cell by just doing a biopsy. But the PET will tell you if it, based on the SCDs, we have what we call the SCD value in the PET. It's called standardized optic value. This value is used to, 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 to tell how active that, that cancer cell is. If it's above five, and it depends on the value of the SUV, they can talk more about the malignancy and about the activity of the activeness of the, of the tumor. So this pet can tell us a, 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 a lesion that is highly malignant compared to benign. Uh, diagnosis of patients with significant increase in risk of malignancy on the basis of elevated tumor marker, like for example, the, the issue of the uh, PSMA, which is for the 
for the can uh, for the prostrate scan. So if you have, you can you can really easily see that okay, based on this, there's a high, a high, a high elevated tumor marker uh, on the accumulation of tumor marker in this thing. The standard is malignant. If it's not highly accumulated, then say it's not malignant. Also, it can be used for staging and staging of high risk, high risk tumors. Uh, distinguish malignant and benign disease, and also you can use a pre-surgical planning. Like, okay, you want to know the area that you want to when you want to do a surgery, which area are more important, and which area should we should we concentrate on? Uh, selecting tumor tumor region for biopsy. Also, it can be used for uh, as a guide for bio to, to 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 take to take sample for biopsy from patient. So, radiotherapy planning. You can also use it for radiotherapy planning. I can use it for assessment of the therapeutic response. I mean, how, res how the patient is responding to treatment. Uh, we, can, we look at evaluation of disease response to chemotherapy as well. And also we can, we can use it as surveillance of high risk malignancy or evaluation of clinical relapse, recur uh, recurrence, tumor recurrence. We can, we can use it to, and where salvage therapies exist and for which early intervention may be curative or prolonged life. I mean, it, it helps to properly manage the patient. You know, so even after the patient has been treated, he, he goes, he, he, he has a follow-up for bed using the, uh, uh, yearly, they normally do a follow-up, and so depending on the protocol actually, they normally do a follow-up on the patient, and maybe uh, some, some, some procedure six months after, after the treatment, you have to come like the thyroid, you understand? Know, you have to come for, for, for post-therapy uh, post follow-up. So it depends on what the, the protocol in the center but it's a very effective tool to, to, to make a follow-up and to, to really detect relapse, quick detect relapse of the tumor and, and decide on the clinical uh, management of that patient. So uh, localize, it also can be used to localize the site of primary tumor when we have a metastasis uh, disease, uh, initial manifestation of malignancy. So for all these clinical scenarios, there are multiple independent examples of where we use the test CT to achieve effective clinical outcome. So uh, now we want to start looking at specific use of PET, PET uh, FDG. We talk about FDG, uh, fluorinating FDG for, for cancer detection. Uh, in 1980, the first, uh, going through the history, Dr. Shiro demonstrated in 1980 that uh, there's a degree of correlation between degree of malignancy in brain tumor based on the FDG uptake uh, in, in the patient by the, by the patient uh, brain. So you now said that uh, FDG has achieved wide use of detection of cancer pr primarily in staging newly diagnosed cancer and recurrent. Uh, data collected from 85,658 patients with a wide variety of cancer has shown that uh, PET FDG imaging change physician intention management in about 36%. That is, maybe, maybe the physician is thinking that, okay, this is a palliative case, or is thinking that this, this cancer uh, it, it needs to be go for, we need to go for therapy. It's a, it's a malignant cancer. But based on the PET scan, you, you may discover that this, what a physician, what they call, based on biopsy, CT, and other things, what they call malignant, malignant cancer might be benign and might not require even a therapy. So in this case, uh, it changes the decision. Of the, sometimes it changes the course of treatment. Like in this 36%, 29% were changed, the treatment cost were changed, okay, to more radical treatment. And only about, about 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, only about 7% were, were not treated. The, the, the treatment plan to, to the plan to continue with the treatment of PET was abandoned because of the because of the use of PET to properly diagnose the patient. Common cancer image with the PET FDG are lymphomas, head and neck cancer, lung cancer, prolectal cancer, we had the breast cancer, sphagia cancer, melanoma, cervical cancer, thyroid cancer, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, and pancreatic cancer, and lots of lots of them. You know, this has been established clinically that PET is effective. Uh, it's not really like the primary tool that we need to, to diagnose, but it's for a confirmed to, uh, cancer case or for a suspected cancer case, it's a very useful tool to use to, to diagnose and to properly, uh, to properly uh, stage the, the, the disease and also have a proper better uh, treatment plan 
or management of the patient. So appearance of the ca cancer in FDV can have aggressive cancer. It normally appears as hot spot. Hot spot means that a bright spot. It will be brighter. It normally, we normally use different viewing uh, uh, window in, in, in uh, it could be normally we use iron out. It appears like cream. So the area of high activity, aggressive cancer, they're going to appear as a very bright red in the, in the image. Whereas the area of, of less activity, like when we talk about well differentiated hepatocellular cancer or adenocarcinoma or something like the thyroid cancer, they appear to be cold. I mean, they, they, will, they will be colder than the, than the, than the other. It, it's, it, they will not be brighter than the background. They will be less bright compared to the background. So activation of varieties of oncogenes result in increase in uptake. Yes, when we have different oncogenes, like the uh, PSMA, you understand? So if they are activated, they are going to increase the uptake of FDG by the patient. In many patients, the degree of FDG uptake is a marker of tumor differentiation. So the, if, as I said before, we can distinguish between aggressive and what a non-aggressive tumor using the, the, the FDG. For example, when a prostate cancer or a thyroid cancer lose the ability to respond to hydrogen and trapped iodine, respectively, they are much more likely to observe this with the FDG PET scan. Our uh, false positive may be positive findings are relatively common. Sometimes you have a false, false positive because of elevated glycolysis is not limited to cancer. That's a, sometimes the elevated, the can have accumulation of glucose somewhere in the body, which is not really related to cancer. Maybe you have an inflammation. Inflammation also we consume a lot of glucose. So inflammation, but it, could, when you have an inflammation, it could be a false positive case when it comes to FDG. I like infectious and inflammatory diseases. These are muscular activity, metabolism of brown fat, and changes in response of the bone marrow stimulating cytokine. And that could be an electric, to result in an elevated glucose uptake in the body. So in this case, we know that FDG might be a false positive. So a physician must be very experienced to be able to distinguish between false positive and, and, uh, and, and the actual positive uh, disease. So that's why it's always good to use, after the, 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 the PET scan, we normally send the patient for biopsy to confirm the, the result. But most of the time, the, the, the first positive is limited, but it's always very positive, but there are some exceptions that are possible. So fluorine, uh, it can, uh, for elevation, uh, for evaluation of, Mass lesion. Uh, we have said, we have said it before. Commonly used for imaging techniques for evaluating mass lesion. Uh, relatively high accuracy because of the uh, because of the high ability for lesion and being malignant, and vast majority of non habit lesion being benign. So this is also a habit means that taking taking lot of glucose and less non habit like it, the consumption of glucose is very low. So exception, we have an exception. Uh, where we have in the, in the region of higher infectious disease, maybe infectious disease is very common in that area, then PET might not be a good option because the infection is going to mimic infection or, or inflammatory disease is going to make, mimic what? It's going to mimic the response of, of, of normal cancer. So you'll be able to distribute, is it a cancer or is it an infection? So it's further studies need, needed to be done. So fluorine 18 FDG plus CT study can help distinguish between benign and malignant masses and can help determine the extent of disease spread. So you can you can you can know how, how, how much the disease has spread and you can confirm that with the with the, what with the fluorine uh, with PET scan. So however, final diagnosis as I have said before should be always be confirmed by biopsy or by other appropriate diagnostic tests. So uh, this is a case, a clinical case of where we use PET to detect solitary pulmonary uh, nodes. So, uh, and this uh, solitary pulmonary node is a common finding, an indeterminate solitary pulmonary load, nodules, nodule is a common, is common in the clinic. So investigating them is also challenging. So one way of investigating uh, to confirm and to investigate such is what? To use the PET CT. And uh, uh, normal investigation and differential diagnosis for the model remain complex, as I said. 
because of that, there's an overlap between what characteristic of benign and malignant process. So now, if you have a S S P S P N, and you want, really want to diagnose, you want to stay it properly, you want to really know is it malignant or benign, then PCT is a very good tool to use to be able to distinguish is it a benign or a malignant tumor. So uh, in the evaluation of the social node, it seems to be is most appropriate and it can be the probability of malignancy and diagnosis sensitivity and accuracy by disease with high glucose metabolism which are inflammatory. So we also, as I said always, we have to compound our findings by doing a biopsy. And the picture on the, on the right is one of the case. This is a, a case, uh, axia on, on, on picture A, the diagram in A is a fused pesity image. And the axial pet image is on the left. This one without CT, the one on the B is without CT, and the one on the left is with CT. So patient with history of epidermoid cervical carcinoma refer for indeterminate pulmonary nodule research. So and with the pet, they are able to confirm that to confirm what SNL in, in the lung, you can see. The area, you can see this area is brightening up. So that shows that elevated uh, uptake of glucose and which confirmed the presence of SNL, uh, 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 solitary uh, pulmonary load in, 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 in that patient. So also we can use it for various type of uh, lymphoma, you understand? So uh, this case, uh, polycal lymphoma can be detected with the bed and it's a most common indolent B cell tumor and the second most common uh, non human lymphoma. So this could be asymptomatic or malignant. So in case of asymptomatic, the, the, the clinical, clinical management is to live with this and watch and follow up. For malignant, it has to be treated early. So the PEST study show hypermetabolic, non-contagious, deep adenopathy and mesenteric mass without obstructive manifestation. You understand? It's, it's really clear. When you look at these two images, this is a 50 years old man diagnosed with what? With FL, which is follicular lymphoma uh, of, the, uh, of the neck and that went this nine staging. So we want to stage this person. On the right, which is the CT, this one, the one, the arrow is, is an axial contrast enhanced computer tomography CT image. Show no diseases. You can see there's nothing. You think that this patient is normal. When you look at the image A, you think that this patient is normal. But if you go for PET CT, you could see the bright spot. You see this arrow showing the bright spot here. These two bright spots, it means that there's an uptake of, of glucose where we don't expect it. So it means that there's, there's something, there's a disease here. And so after biopsy, it was confirmed that the patient is having a follicular lymphoma. So this is a good example of where PCT be able to distinguish. Where CT could not identify that the patient is having disease, but with the use of the PET scan and PET, PET imaging technique, we are able to identify that the disease is present in what in the patient. So uh, based on the report, showing that uh, the PET CT alter initial staging in follicular lymphoma by 19% of the patient. So out of the patient that the, the, the staging process is, is, is changed after the PET scan, which is a very 19% is a great number, is a, a great amount. That's 90% of cases, even people can publish paper for 1% changes. For this, like 90%, which is a lot when you talk about clinical su success, that PET is to, to successfully diagnose political lymphoma uh, in, in uh, you know, so yeah. 90% changes in physician opinion of, on treating the patient and staging of the political lymphoma. This is a great source. And uh, we should understand that SCV greater than 10 has 81% sensitivity. Sorry, uh, not, not dollar, that's percent. Maybe I'm looking for dollar. That's what I think. So it has 81% sensitivity for assessment of histological transformation. Biopsy is needed to confirm histology. Anytime we have a, we have a confirmation in test, we normally send the patient for biopsy to confirm the findings. So this is another lymphoma, marginal zone lymphoma. And we can see that uh, marginal zone lymphoma is very common. It's the third most common non skin lymphoma that we have. This has three subtypes. We have the splenic uh, ML, MLZ 
and we have another NLZ, and we have the Escanada and Makusa uh, Mukosa uh, associated lymphoid TU lymphoma, which we call the MOT. So 70% of the MZ, MZ marginal zone lymphoma are FDG and they, are, they take a lot of FDG. The, the uptake is high. So imaging finding of on fluorine FDG FCT depends on the organ involved. For splenic MZ, MZL, marginal zone lymphoma often present with hypermetabolic splenomegaly with or without a discrete focal masses. And mod lymphoma are less avid. They are less avid, but yet we can still there are some, some of the mod lymphoma. I mean, mod means, like I said, the extranodal mucosa associated lymphoma T. So some of the mod, like gastric mod, may appear as hypermetabolic uh, polypoida or infiltrative gastric masses with more frequent lower activity. Uh, and IRSV value has shown to correlate more with more to you aggressiveness and higher relapse rate. So when you have ISUD, then the TU is the tumor is aggressive, also what and also what there's high chances of relapse. So we have to strategize our plan treatment, uh, patient uh, treatment plan, and we have to select the best plan for the patient. So if FDG play a role between disease localized to the stomach, sinuses, or orbit as against disseminated diseases. So looking at this uh, patient, there are three patients with mouth lymphoma. A, this A, a short uptake in the stomach proven by biopsy. You can see the uptake. You know, I told you that the, uh, when, you talk, when you talk about mouth, it's not really avid. The uptake, the FDG consumption by, by this type of uh, lymphoma is, is, not, is not that much. So you will not see a very bright area, but you can still see an uptake like this. You can still see an uptake in the, in the patient um, with good processing and image processing. You can still see that there's high uptake here. So you can, you can really distinguish. Like for instance, the B, uh, the patient, the second patient fused FDG per CT axial images of the head in the patient with lacrima mod lymphoma. So the, the, the disease is air. And you can see, and in this case, you see how important this um, this pet is. It will guide us to accurately control that area out, and so I can give you can give treatment while saving the other part of the of the eye. So that's why the F, F, uh, the um, pet CT scan is really important in radiation oncology. And the third image here is the, the third patient is an, also an axial image of the neck, in addition to the patient showing moderate FDG at the left parotide mode. This is, you can see, looking at the right parotide, you see that it's less, the consumption is a bit less compared to the left. I can see the left is a bit bright. So it means that there's, there's a disease here and it's confirmed that it's a left parotide uh, mode lymphoma. So with the use of, uh, with the use of a test CT, we are able to distinguish between, uh, you know, we, we are able to properly diagnose to stage the patient uh, the disease using the pet CT. So this is another case of a 73 years old woman who came for initial staging of non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, the, the MIP, which is uh, uh, the MIP image, we have what we call the MIP image, which is like intensity, uh, with, uh, high, high intensity image that we normally have in bed. So the image on the left panel, you see the CT image in the middle, and on the, on the right, we have the FDG pet CT, the right. So when you look at it, uh, you can see this area is an uptake, which shows, uh, you see this arrow with, with the media, media, stand, media stand and media you understand, with net, this is a net. So I can easily discover this, you can easily identify this in the city. And when you look at the city, let's look at the city, the middle image, and look at the first city. This city, if you are not very good, you will get confused. Interpreting the, the image, the decision can get a bit confused. But with the pet CT, there's no confusion. This is an uptake. The uptake in the media standard. And you can see, we'll see another uptake here. With this, you can, can say, yes, the patient is having, even when you look at the bowel, this is close to the bowel. You understand? It, so with, with pet CT, we can really discover those areas that, are, that would not be, that would be oblivion 
that will not that are not easily seen on what on a bed in, on a on a CT image. It can be seen on a bed image. So we can also use bed CT for monitoring tumor responses. Uh, it's a very useful tool for monitoring during treatment and assessing response after treatment. So we can also use it to detect early response to treatment. I'll, I'll show an example of that. Also, we can use it to improve management decision of oncology, oncology cases. I have seen, we have shown you the, that the a physician are changing their opinion about the treatment of the patient in 90 percent of cases, and in some cases only like 26 percent of the cases, or even some cases that more than 36 percent of the cases in some studies. So using our capacity, it helps us to uh, improve management decision. For example, data of National Oncology Pet Registry indicated that out of the 10,497 treatment monitored, uh, patient monitored with PET scan uh, worldwide, physician intended management change in about 50% of the patient. Out of 10,000, 50% of the decision were changed after they have gone for PET scan, including switching to another therapy, 27% of the patient, and adjustment, because if, if the patient, for example, somebody with hypoxia, hypoxia tumor, using therapy might not be good, using radiation therapy might not be the best option for him. Maybe they have to look at other things because it, it, it's, not, it's not well oxygenated. For us to have a success in radiation therapy, we need it to be well oxygenated. So sending the patient for therapy with, with the linear or radiation therapy is not a good option. So 50% of the decision were changed after the test scan. And 70% of the patient uh, adjustment, those were adjusted in 70% of the patient. And a switch from therapy to observation and supportive care in 6% of the patient, yes, which correlates well with patient health outcome. So we do that. This it support the decision, clinical decision, what to do with the patient, having a test center, having a test scan for the patient with, with oncology patient is a very is a, is, is not really like it's not luxury. It's something that is essential. It's something that will improve the outcome of the treatment. It's something that the patient uh, let me know when the time what uh, how much time do you guys still have? Your time is up. Oh <laughs> Well, just round up, round up. So I'll, I'll, just, I'll just go through. Uh, this is the case of a patient, uh, you see. This is a monitor. This is a patient, a, a patient with therapy, you understand? This patient on there is pre pre scan before pre-treatment. And after treatment, after pre-cycle, you can see the, the, this is almost clear, you understand? So this is like, well, if for radiation therapy, you don't do that. Not monitor the patient with after radiation therapy because of the inflammation and some other things that happen. But it's seen that you can still you can still have a bad when you have a, a decrease in FDG uptake in high grade glioma, the therapy will be better outcome if there is decrease in, uh, in uptake. So prognosis of the use, proliferation can be between benign and malignant tumor. And uh, we can talk about radiation therapy planning of the brain also. You see, what PET CT, we can you can use PET CT, FLT for that. And you can see this is the MRI image. When you look at the when you can the density image, it's more brighter. So it, it has a better, 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 better prediction compared to MRI. Uh, so they use gallium dot That's for the neuroendocrine uh, tumor. So um, this is a, this is a, for treatment planning. You know, the patient is brought to treatment planning and the contouring is with the help of the density, you can make an accurate contouring of the patient uh, disease, which is because in, 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 in SRS, when you want to treat patients, people don't normally support whole brain, uh, whole brain uh, treatment for, for for brain tumor. So if the brain is if the if the if the is localized is discrete, then we can we can use SRS to deliver very high. You know those painting is there in radiation oncology. So you deliver high dose to the to the tumor or kill it one time. So in summary, test CT can be used to calculate the optimal radiation dose for tumor while minimizing the dose to surrounding healthy tissue by proper guiding and proper contouring. This can help in reducing side effects and improving treatment outcome. PET imaging has several applications in radiation oncology, which include cancer staging, treatment planning, response assessment, and follow-up imaging. Also, by providing more accurate information on the location and extent of the tumor, PCT can help in planning and adjusting radiation therapy decisions while minimizing the dose towards the healthy tumor. 
So the future, we need a uh, development of more these are these are things that are still a challenge, a bit of challenge to to using of the bed. We need to develop more refrigerator to for target specific molecular pathway involved in cancer growth and prevention. Advancement in technology also is we need that to improve the resolution. Also, clinical trials and research and potential for personal personal personalized medicine. Bed has the potential for personalized medicine. Thank you for your time. And I see that this scanning is refined cancer diagnosis and treatment with a better treatment outcome for the for our patients. Thank you so much.